morning, everyone. Welcome to the Facial Paralysis and Bell's Palsy Foundation presents the latest treatment options for facial paralysis. I'm Lisa McKinley, director of our foundation, and I want to thank you for taking part in our first ever live webinar. I hope you will find this presentation informative and helpful to you. Um, our presentation should last approximately 40 minutes, and then we'll take questions from attendees. Um, if you are online, you can type your questions in the, under the questions box on the control panel on your screen, and then we will answer them as time allows. I would now like to introduce our presenter today. Dr. Babaka Zizadeh is the founder and president of our foundation and the director of the Facial Paralysis Institute in Beverly Hills, California. He is a graduate of UCLA School of Medicine and a former clinical fellow at Harvard Medical School. He's double board certified by the American Board of Facial Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery and the American Board of um, Otolaryngology, sorry, head and neck surgery. Dr. Zizadeh is also an assistant clinical professor of surgery at UCLA School of Medicine. Welcome, Dr. Zizadeh. We're happy to have you today, and I will now get ready to pass the screen to you for your presentation. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I really appreciate the uh, time and effort that uh, Lisa and Barbara uh, Pasternacki have put uh, in uh, doing our first webinar for the foundation. Hopefully we'll uh, create a series of webinars to uh, give uh, the community uh, more information from uh, all as uh, aspects of uh, facial paralysis, not just uh, reanimation and reconstruction, but also uh, social related issues, uh, uh, therapy, uh, and uh, other, uh, other uh, opportunities for us to get together and improve um, the awareness of uh, facial paralysis. So today I'm going to focus on, um, on what uh, we look at for uh, facial nerve paralysis when we're thinking about reconstruction. And uh, hopefully at the end, if you have any questions and if time permits, we'll answer some questions uh, and uh, give you uh, additional information. So uh, obviously, uh, before uh, we start talking about reconstruction, we have to understand uh, the facial nerve anatomy. Uh, and uh, it's very, very important to, uh, as, at least from a reconstructive standpoint, to understand where uh, the facial nerves um, kind of uh, start in the brain uh, and what crucial areas uh, we see uh, pathology uh, with a facial nerve. Uh, the facial nerve uh, uh, is uh, the area where the brain generates uh, facial nerve movement uh, uh, is uh, in the facial nerve nucleus, which is in the brain. And part of the nerve uh, uh, generation starts on the opposite side uh, of the brain, uh, and part of it uh, is on the same side of the brain. And that's important for individuals who unfortunately have stroke or other issues. As the nerve uh, kind of uh, transitions uh, into an area where we call the cerebellopontine angle, that's where uh, uh, issues such as acoustic neuromas and so forth arise. And the nerve then travels out of the brain and into uh, a bone behind the ear, which is called the temporal bone. In this area, the nerve kind of goes through a very circuitous route before it comes out of the uh, temporal bone and comes on to the face. And it's in the face where it starts dividing into different segments. Part of it goes into the forehead, eye area, and then there are multiple branches that go to the face for our small mechanisms. And then there are branches that go to the lower face and neck area. And this is very, very important because uh, part of the nerve actually is not for smiling, but rather for frowning. 
part of it is for expressions such as anger. So we have to understand the entire course of the nerve to understand what's going on. And when we're considering doing facial surgery for aesthetic reasons, we have to understand what layers these nerves belong to. So what does the facial nerve do? Uh, obviously, we all know that uh, it is uh, it addresses the muscles of facial expression, but it also carries some taste fibers to the front of the tongue and also uh, secretions of the tear gland and salivary glands as well. The muscles of uh, 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 facial expression, again, as discussed, uh, some uh, are for smiling, and the most dominant one is the zygomaticus major, which allows an upward movement of the corner of the mouth but there is extensive amount of muscles that are for frowning and showing anger, uh, et cetera. Around the eyes, their muscles allow us to blink and close our eyes, and the forehead allows us to elevate the eyebrows, and around the mouth, it allows us to purse the lips, which helps with articulation and control of food and the mouth. We also have a muscle called the nasalis muscle that allows the opening of the nostrils to be a little bit tighter and we don't get collapse. There are three types of smiles. Um, the majority of individuals, about two out of three people, have what's called a zygomatic smile. If you think about the Mona Lisa smile, it's the same thing, where you just see upper teeth and the corner of the mouth moves. About a third of individuals have what's called a canine smile, which again, it's dominated by the zygomatic major, but also there's an upward movement of the upper lip. And only a small percentage of individuals have a full denture smile where you see both the upper teeth, gum line, and the lower teeth. So when someone smiles with a full denture smile, uh, they activate all the muscles around their mouth. The causes of facial paralysis are variable. The most common cause is Bell's palsy. Now, this is very, very, very important to understand because as uh, you gain more uh, experience in understanding the etiology and the causes of facial paralysis, it's important for you to educate others who develop this. Bell's palsy, uh, not all facial paralysis is Bell's palsy. Bell's palsy is only considered Bell's palsy when there is no other cause found for facial paralysis. So somebody who has facial paralysis from an acoustic neuroma does not have Bell's palsy. So Bell's palsy is caused, we think, by a viral reactivation of herpes simplex virus, which is essentially a cold sore of the lip uh, that can remain dormant uh, and many years later get activated. Other causes uh, that are infectious uh, include, again, same thing like chicken pox, which is zoster. Lyme disease is the most common cause of bilateral facial paralysis. Tumors, whether benign or aggressive, can cause uh, facial paralysis. Acoustic neuroma is the most common uh, cause, and we'll go through, and it's not really the acoustic neuroma, but the surgical removal of the acoustic neuroma. Facial neuromas, parotid malignancies, uh, uh, metastasis from other areas, uh, congenital causes or what people are born with, the most common is Mobius syndrome, uh, which causes bilateral facial paralysis, and we'll show you some examples. Something that we call CULP, this is called the congenital unilateral lower lip palsy, we'll go through uh, what uh, how that presents um, and a very uh, quick uh, solution for that. Trauma can cause facial paralysis such as temporal bone fractures, uh, lacerations, birth deliveries, and we could obviously get um, stroke neurologic issues that basically uh, we know uh, it's uh, resulting from a stroke when the Forehead can still move on both sides, but the lower face is paralyzed. And that's because the forehead gets, um, uh, gets nerve input from the opposite side of the brain as well. 
So acoustic neuroma, um, it's uh, a growth, uh, a, uh, actually a benign growth uh, at the cerebellopontine angle. That's the area just before the nerve leaves the brain and comes into the temporal bone as we discussed. Uh, it's um, usually the eighth cranial nerve uh, that uh, is where the little Schwann cells grow excessively. Um, it, it accounts the acoustic neuroma is about 80% of all, all cerebellopontine angles. Meningiomas are 20% of the tumors in that area, which can also, while we're removing it, can cause uh, paralysis. Um, it occurs in about one out of 100,000 people. And individuals who have neurofibromatosis too generally have bilateral acoustic neuromas. And again, the growth is often slow. Facial nerve can usually accommodate the stretching without any clinical symptoms. And as you can see again, in this example, there's a growth and the facial nerve is around it. Uh, typically, the surgical approaches uh, are they, uh, multiple different approaches depending on the size, depending on what the hearing status of the individual is. Bell's palsy, also we call it idiopathic facial nerve paralysis. This is the most common cause of facial paralysis. Again, we call it a diagnosis of exclusion. Uh, individuals who have Bell's palsy typically have it very quickly. It's not very slow. It happens quickly. And again, it's usually a result of inflammation in that bony, in that temporal bone that I showed you guys that has a very circuitous route. Uh, about 20 uh, 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 cases occur per 100,000 people annually. And uh, Ramsey-Hunt syndrome, which is different than Bell's palsy, is uh, a result of uh, uh, the zoster uh, 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 reactivation. And again, you see facial paralysis, hearing loss, a lot of pain. So patients who have Bell's palsy, about 85% regain complete recovery of facial motor function. About 10% have some incomplete recovery with minor minor uh, facial and smile asymmetry. That is probably not noticeable to most individuals, but except to themselves. But 5% complete uh, develop uh, some neurologic changes, uh, and we'll talk about it, which is primarily synkinesis. And these individuals have a pretty significant facial asymmetry and smile asymmetry. Uh, head and neck tumors, such as parotid gland uh, tumors, can also cause facial paralysis. Uh, usually benign tumors do not cause facial paralysis, uh, except when they're large and while they're being removed uh, can cause facial nerve injury. Malignant tumors typically do present with facial paralysis uh, at the time of uh, onset. So now we've talked about the causes or the main causes that we see on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's also now important to understand the different types of paralysis. These two individuals that you're looking at both have right-sided facial paralysis, but obviously have very different presentations. Uh, the individual on uh, your left on the screen's right has a complete paralysis. There is no movement at all. There's no muscle activity. The individual on, this, uh, on the left side of the screen has partial paralysis and synkinesis. So the smile mechanism is not right and it's not working very well, but the overall um, appearance appears to have, um, appears to have uh, uh, an ex a very different type of facial palsy. So when we're looking at facial paralysis types, we are looking at patients who have complete paralysis, partial paralysis with synkinesis, and we'll show you examples. Partial paralysis without synkinesis, bilateral paralysis, and congenital unilateral lower lip palsy, and I'll show you examples of all of them. So an individual who has complete facial paralysis has a complete smile dysfunction, as you can see in this individual, inability to close eyes, 
drooping of the eyebrows, lower lid mouth position where the lower lid is down. Again, there's no movement, collapse of the nasal valve, and articulation difficulties, fluid escapes from the mouth, and there's biting of the lips and gum line. Partial paralysis with synkinesis, as we had showed earlier, is usually a result of the nerve is intact, but it's just not functioning well. There's uncoordinated and simultaneous movement. And basically the way to think about it is the smiling muscles and the frowning muscles are being activated at the same time. So the movement of the face when someone's trying to smile, rather than it going up, it goes sideways or down. So that's how you have to think about what synkinesis is. And you also get narrowing of the eye and so forth. So in partial paralysis with synkinesis, the smile is not going up, it's going down. And the eyes are narrowing, the upper, lower lip is staying up, you get dimpling. You actually get most of the time brow elevation rather than brow depression. And you get activity, hyperactivity of the platysmal muscle. This is uh, an individual who has partial paralysis without synkinesis, and uh, there is movements, but unfortunately not upward movement as much as uh, we like, sideway, uh, sideway movement. Uh, so you get part of both a complete paralysis and a uh, synkinesis. Usually individuals were with congenital or developmental facial paralysis do not have synkinesis and they get some movement, but not uh, great movement. An individual who has Mobius syndrome cannot generate any smile, and you get this masked face with inability to smile or show any emotions, um, uh, also an inability to close their eyes. There's significant functional deficits with drooling, articulation issues, and inability to purse lips. And obviously, we also, with Mobius patients, because of the lack of ability to communicate, the patients have a significant uh, issue with that as well. So this is a very interesting uh, other cause of facial paralysis, which is called a CULP, congenital unilateral lower lip palsy. We see a lot of patients. Uh, this is a patient who has a right-sided congenital unilateral lower lip palsy. The left side, the lower lip moves. The right side, the lower lip does not move down. So a very simple solution for this is um, either doing Botox through this muscle or actually nipping uh, the nerve uh, on the left side to even out the two sides. And it's a very quick and simple solution. Now, what are our goals with facial reanimation? Obviously, we want to think about the psychosocial, functional, and aesthetic because individuals who have facial paralysis obviously have uh, uh, as you, you very well know, uh, significant social issues. Um, and we want to make sure that we regain uh, uh, your confidence, regain the ability to socialize. And um, that's a huge important part uh, of what our goal is. Uh, patients oftentimes have depression. Patients oftentimes uh, feel that they're alone. That's why the foundation is really wonderful, brings a lot of people together, and uh, we're really excited about that. Um, but we want to make sure uh, that we can also uh, improve the functional issues, such as drooling, inability to articulate well, and aesthetically, obviously, we want to create a good smile. So facial nerve reconstruction, uh, albeit uh, we have really advanced tremendously over the last decade, is not perfect, and uh, we cannot truly reproduce a perfect smile. However, we have really, really tried to push the envelope and try to get advances that are beyond uh, uh, what we, can, we could have done 10, 15 years ago. So functionally, we want to improve articulation, drooling, biting of the gums and nasal obstruction. We want to prevent eye com complication. This is especially true for individuals who just got facial paralysis. And we want to improve synkinesis and tightness. Aesthetically, we want to create symmetry of the face, 
eyes and brows, an obviously smile mechanism. Now, when we're evaluating uh, individuals who have facial paralysis, it's really important to understand the timing of the facial paralysis. Someone who comes in immediately with an immediate onset is going to be somewhat treated differently than someone who's had it for the past 12 months. So it's a very, very important uh, aspect of what you need to be aware of if someone you know. Again, you're going to be, well, hopefully the individuals who are on this webinar obviously are looking at finding some solution for themselves. But eventually, uh, you're going to also be out there in the community and you're going to have friends who are going to call you and say, oh, a friend of mine has developed facial paralysis. So we need to make sure that the patients are getting treated appropriately and accordingly. We're getting doctor opinions that are appropriate. So if someone presents with an immediate onset facial paralysis, uh, first, uh, we want to find what the cause is. If there's no known cause, uh, uh, after full examination by, by either an emergency physician, uh, otolaryngologist, ENT surgeon, uh, facial nerve specialist or neurologist, um, uh, we have to do a complete evaluation to rule out any type of neoplasm. Uh, we got to get a great history. We got to do a good, great neurologic examination. An ear evaluation has to be done, and sometimes imaging, depending on the presentation. The most important management outside of that is eye care. So we want to use artificial tears to avoid getting dryness. Use uh, lubrication, uh, something called lacquer lube, which is essentially Vaseline for the eyes. Uh, we want to tape the eyes shut at night if it's open, and we want to get an ophthalmology evaluation. If uh, the paralysis occurred uh, during an acoustic neuroma, surgical removal. Uh, uh, if the surgeons, again, the uh, neurotologists and the neurosurgeons see it right away, generally they'll want to uh, do a nerve graft at the time. If post-op, after the surgery, the patient, I mean, during the surgery, the nerve was completely intact, but after the surgery, the patient woke up with, um, with facial paralysis, it really, uh, the treatment is really dependent on the status of the nerve during surgery. But this is a very, very important slide. We do not want to wait more than 18 months, really 12 months, if the nerve is completely paralyzed. This is really, really important because there are a lot of treatments that need to be done within two years of the paralysis, of the paralysis to be able to get the best possible outcome. So this is really, really key, whether it's with acoustic neuroma or a temporal bone fracture or other causes that occur as a result of trauma. This is a very, very important slide. Okay, so um, let's say a patient uh, comes into the emergency room. Uh, full examination is done. There's no known cause found. Then we're gonna give them a diagnosis of Bell's palsy at that time. And at that time, we're going to start treatment with high-dose steroids. So patients cannot just have, you know, a typical metrol dose pack, which is a very low-dose steroid treatment. you got to make sure that they're getting high-dose steroids, prednisone most of the time, antiviral treatments. And sometimes, depending on the uh, patient and ideology, sometimes a facial nerve decompression is uh, required. Now, that's a whole different topic of discussion, and perhaps we will do a webinar where we talk about facial nerve decompression, but um, uh, at, at, the, at the least, we want to make sure we do the high-dose prednisone and antiviral like Valtrex or Fanbear. If the patient comes in from trauma, that, for example, the patient had a facelift or the patient had a laceration that the face is completely cut or some other intervention, that patient needs to be evaluated and treated within a week or two. And generally, if the nerves are bound, we want to do a facial nerve anastomosis and nerve repair. Uh, and it's really, really, really important. If it's a temporal bone fracture, we want to consider decompression. If it's a, prom a parotid tumor, we want to do nerve grafting or so the nerves together if possible. Primary nerve repair is, again, very, very important part of our 
algorithm. If it's possible to do a primary nerve repair, we always want to do it. Again, in case of trauma, uh, maybe someone had a facelift surgery, maybe someone had a parotid tumor removal. So we want to get the edges of the nerves, if they're available and accessible, bring them together, sew them either primarily or do a nerve graft, which is easy to get a nerve graft. And we want to do it in, you know, ideally within a couple of weeks. Patients actually get very good results with uh, a good smile, but they do tend to get synkinesis, especially if the nerve graft is closer to the main trunk rather than distally. But the patients get good muscle tone. This is a young girl who, um, on a medical mission, uh, was uh, found to have a laceration over the ear uh, that was inflicted by a family member, unfortunately. And I was able to um, uh, find both edges. It was an, actually an infected wound, do a primary nerve repair. And as you can see, uh, the uh, smile is uh, acceptable, good nasolabial folds. Again, there's synkinesis. You see the corner of the mouth isn't going perfectly up, but certainly the eyes are closing better and the patient has a much better symmetry, and this is a one-year result. This is a, a patient who uh, uh, had a laceration, or had actually a cosmetic procedure that resulted, as you could see, almost a complete facial paralysis, uh, and uh, postoperatively, this is the video. As you can see, he got an excellent improvement. Now, we're going to jump now away from individuals who have complete paralysis or uh, immediate paralysis to individuals who come in. And this is probably the majority of our audience right now, individuals who've had acoustic neuromas or Bell's palsy or some other cause of facial paralysis maybe a year ago, two years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. So uh, we always want to reevaluate and make sure that the cause of the paralysis was understood uh, and make sure there's no evidence of tumor or recurrence or any other factor. Uh, treatment typically, uh, we typically wait about a year uh, before initiating treatment from the time of onset. And if uh, the nerve at the time was sacrificed or, you know, uh, as we talked about, if we know uh, from, again, acoustic neuroma or trauma or some other cause, we want to start treatment right away. Okay, so what are our treatment options? And again, these are going to be topics that we're going to create webinars uh, like this. Neuromuscular retraining will be one topic that we'll do a webinar for and I think it'll be excellent. Uh, so that is definitely a treatment option, especially for individuals who have synkinesis um, and partial paralysis. Uh, fillers and Botox are excellent options for patients who have um, uh, synkinesis and also patients who have partial uh, paralysis or total paralysis that we want to create volume symmetry. Uh, I'm not going to go deeply into these topics as uh, we're going to focus a little bit more on surgery, but this is a great, um, what I would call, additional treatments that create that final subtle improvement, and for some patients, significant improvement that's necessary. Surgical treatments are the mainstay of treatments. These are, uh, uh, this is what uh, I think at this point in time, uh, most patients who have long-term facial paralysis can benefit from surgery and we have multiple different operations for the for different patients depending on what their cause of paralysis was and what type of paralysis they have and what their goals are. So the surgical options, we always kind of categorize them into three different, uh, uh, three different uh, uh, categories. Uh, static, dynamic, which is voluntary dynamic, and spontaneous dynamic. I'll go through what the differences are. So static, basically static surgical options improve symmetry at rest without any improvement in smile. So they create nice nasolabial fold, the oral commissure can be improved or the corner of the mouth. But static procedures generally don't allow us to have a smiling 
option. Patients who have, uh, who, uh, or surgical options that create smile mechanisms, we call, uh, call dynamic surgical options. And there are smile mechanisms that can be created voluntarily. That means that the patient is conscious of it. When they want to move their face, they have to be conscious of it. Or spontaneous, where it's an emotional unconscious smile mechanism. My ideal treatment is always developing dynamic, spontaneous smile mechanism where the patient or the individual is not really conscious and can really smile emotionally. So let's look at some static uh, options. And this is, the static options are not bad options. And for certain individuals, they're really, really great. Again, an individual that just wants to get symmetry, doesn't wants to reduce um, uh, drooling, uh, improve articulation, this is great. So a static sling procedure, which is usually performed with a facelift, lifts the face, uh, corner of the mouth, can create a nice laugh line, and can be performed actually with other dynamic operations. Typically, we use something called the tensor fascia lata, which is this little tendon on the outer uh, part of the thigh, or we can use something called alloderm, which is a uh, basically a collagen matrix uh, that uh, is uh, processed from, a, uh, from cadavers. And again, you can get nice upward movement of the corner of the mouth, improved laugh line, but not a real smile. Again, for some individuals, it can produce really, really great results because they already have some movement and you can kind of create a nicer laugh line and improve the movement of the corner of the mouth. Brow lifts are also static procedures. Um, uh, and uh, I, they're excellent for the eyebrows. I think they're actually ideal for the eyebrows. You can elevate drooping eyebrows, improve symmetry, and sometimes with Botox on the non-paralyzed side, you can get really, really excellent options, excellent outcome. And you can do it either endoscopically or using a direct, sorry, using a direct uh, elevation. And it's really an excellent option for this area. Lower lip reconstruction typically is static because we just want to elevate and lift the corner of the eyes. And uh, typically, there are really great new options. Uh, canthoplasties and, and Dr. Masri, which is one of my colleagues, who will probably do our next webinar talking about eyelid reconstruction, has developed some really excellent options uh, for uh, lower eyelid reconstruction, which is, again, typically static. And this is one of his before and afters, as you can see, on an individual who had a significant uh, lower lid malposition. For poor eye closure, which we call lag of thalamus, typically uh, gold or platinum chain weights are excellent static options for eye closure, but there are also dynamic options such as the palpebral spring, which uh, Dr. Robert Levine uh, has uh, pioneered and has done a wonderful job. So depending on the individual, there are different options with lag of thalamus. So now we're going to talk about dynamic options. So dynamic, again, individuals that can, uh, that can develop uh, movement, create smile uh, uh, mechanisms. So static options, again, just improve symmetry, but don't give you smile mechanisms. Dynamic options do give you smile mechanism. So one of the... Uh, tried and true dynamic uh, reanimation options is the temporalis transfer. Now this uh, temporalis transfer does not create a spontaneous smile. It creates a voluntary smile. So what that means, again, is the individual has to bite down to be able to move the muscle or uh, create a smile. So the temporalis muscle is a chewing muscle. It's innervated by a different cranial nerve. It's not by the facial nerve. It's by the trigeminal nerve. So either the muscle or the muscle tendon is secured to the corner of the mouth to help lift and allow, again, a conscious smile. 
It also provides an excellent static procedure and a conscious dynamic movement. Uh, and again, the smile is initiated by biting down. And this is an example of the tendon. We call it the orthodromic temporalis tendon transfer, uh, uh, which is an excellent option. Uh, and as you can see, it creates good symmetry at rest. And again, for some individuals, this is fantastic. Uh, individual who has very uh, significant parotid surgery in the past or radiation therapy in the past, I like this option. Uh, extensively. And as you can see, it produces actually a pretty good small and a significant improvement in the static position. Now, um, outside of the temporalis transfer, nerve substitution techniques, which are basically uh, the way to think about it is your facial nerve isn't moving your facial muscles. Let's plug in another one of the nerves that are nearby into the facial nerve to help the facial muscles move. So over the past century, there have been several uh, nerves that have been uh, transferred to the facial nerve to allow it to move, such as the spinal accessory nerve. That's the nerve that goes to the shoulder, so an individual can help move the face by lifting their shoulder. You can use the hypoglossal nerve, which is the nerve that goes to the tongue. Again, by pushing the tongue out, you could make the face move. And the hypoglossal nerve is the most commonly used nerve substitution technique. Um, it essentially, the, the nice thing about the hypoglossal nerve, it gives nice nerve input into the non-functioning facial nerve and muscle, so it creates a resting tone, which is excellent. And you can move the face with the tongue. Um, the uh, nerve, facial nerve, and all facial muscles need to be available. So you can't do this on someone who had an acoustic neuroma 20 years ago. Uh, this is some. This is one of the reasons that we want to treat patients within a year, year and a half. Because after a year and a half, if your nerve and muscles aren't getting any input, the muscles atrophy. So uh, this is an excellent option, and uh, we do like using it. Um, my colleague Bill Slattery. Um, and I uh, uh, utilize uh, a particular technique that's uh, given excellent results. And um, uh, we do want to avoid using this, uh, the hypoglossal nerve, if there are multiple other nerves involved, if someone has neurofibromatosis 2, NF2, if they have adenoid cystic or partial paralysis. We often combine it with other techniques that also give us spontaneous movement because it's really hard for patients to move their face by pushing their tongues out. It's not a natural movement. This is a, a young uh, uh, gentleman who had a right side of facial paralysis and as you could see, got a very nice result from a hypoglossal facial nerve transfer. I'll show you a little bit later what we did in addition to this at a later time. This is a lovely lady who had a complete left facial paralysis from an acoustic neuroma. We did a facelift, hypoglossal facial nerve transfer, brow lift, gold weight, uh, lower lip uh, reconstruction, and uh, as you can see, has a much better nasolabial fold, corner of her mouth is more even, and got an excellent result. Now, one of my favorite uh, procedures that I've, uh, I've kind of uh, refined a bit in my own uh, technique uh, is the masseteric facial nerve transfer. So instead of using the nerve that goes to the tongue, we use the nerve that goes to the masseter muscle. So it's a chewing muscle. Again, it's the trigeminal nerve. So what we do, as you can see in this picture, we find the masseteric nerve, which is right in this area below the uh, cheekbone, find the facial nerve, and flip it over and attach it to each other. So when the patient, uh, individual uh, bites down, the face moves. So this uh, creates a very nice facial tone. It moves the face with clenching. You have a little bit less synkinesis than the hypoglossal nerve, and you have a little bit better and earlier smile mechanism. And this can be used with patients who have NF2 or other cranial nerve disorders because the masteric uh, muscle isn't that important in chewing and swallowing, whereas the hypoglossal nerve 
is very, very important in chewing and swallowing. So if you have a compromise of other uh, nerves, then you have to, um, you have to be uh, conscientious about that. Again, this is the masteric nerve, this is the facial nerve, and as you can see, the masteric nerve is flipped over, brought over, and the facial nerve is brought. Now, this is my, uh, my technique. There are other techniques that go straight into this, but I really have seen great results with this. This is a young, uh, young lady with the complete right facial paralysis. And as you can see, about four months after her um, uh, masteric facial nerve transfer, you see upward movement, which is really much better than the hypoglossal. So as you could see, that was a live video, or uh, uh, not a live video, but a, a video of before and after. And you could see there's a significant improvement. And one of the key things, if you could see, is the number of teeth you see on the right side. You almost see no teeth past the central uh, incisors. So that is a very, very important aspect of creating what we had called a Mona Lisa smile uh, for the individual. This is a few few months later. This is a few months later, about one year later. And as you can see, again, nice nasolabial fold, great teeth, and you could see a lot more teeth actually a few months later. This is another individual, a uh, lovely, lovely uh, young lady who had a complete paralysis. And again, we did the masteric facial transfer. And as you can see, it also helps with the lower eye, eye position. The corner of the mouth is elevated, and the uh, patient did quite well. And this is a soft Mona Lisa smile. Now, this is not spontaneous, and that's one of the, um, uh, one of the uh, downfalls of this procedure. So we generally do combine it with a cross-based nerve graft and gracilis muscle flop, which we'll show you later, um, that will help create that spontaneity. Okay, so the gracilis muscle transfer motorized by the opposite facial nerve, which we call the cross-facial nerve graft, is a really, really important uh, tool in our uh, surgical uh, treatment of individuals who have facial paralysis. So basically what this operation allows us is we have one side of the face that's paralyzed. So the nerve is not functioning or not functioning well. We have the other side of the face, which has a normal facial movement. Uh, now, because when we smile, both facial nerves kind of get activated at the same time, we can utilize or borrow a little nerve activity from the normal side to help the paralyzed side get movement. So basically what we do is a two-stage operation. Um, uh, in the first stage, we uh, basically get a nerve graft from the ankle. And, and nine out of 10 individuals, we just make a little incision here with a new technique that I've developed. Um, we attach this nerve, which is a sural nerve, to the normal facial nerve, a little branch of the normal facial nerve. Then we come back in the second stage, we get a little muscle from the inner thigh, bring that muscle into the side that's paralyzed, attach the nerve of this muscle to that nerve that we transferred in that first stage, attach the artery and vein of the muscle to the artery and vein in the neck and jaw area. Again, this is a muscle, a small segment of the gracilis muscle. It has a nerve, artery, and vein. And once it's attached, again, as you can see, the nerve of this muscle is attached to that cross-facial nerve graft. And it's done, believe it or not, under the gum area. With a couple of sutures, it's closed. So this is a young, lovely, lovely, one of my favorite patients who developed who had uh, left facial paralysis. And 
as you could see the before and after, and it's spontaneous. She's not really thinking about it. This is, again, a little bit later. Okay. These are the incisions. Again, additional uh, and um, uh, older lady, uh, not older lady, but older than the young ladies that we just showed. And you could do this very, very nicely. Again, other before and afters of the same type of procedures. This is another lady who we did both the mastered facial nerve transfer and, and uh, gracilis. So she had both a uh, mastoid facial nerve transfer as well as the cross-facial nerve graft done at one stage. Then we went back in and did uh, a gracilis flap to help her achieve a much more spontaneous uh, improvement. She also got sculpture for her temporal atrophy and eyelid reconstruction. And again, you could see a lot of teeth, good laugh line, pretty good symmetry. So postoperatively, uh, the patients, about 10% of patients will require some sort of touch-up. They do need neuromuscular retraining, and the movement is typically seen after six months. So I'm going to just quickly, over the next few minutes, talk about a new, uh, new procedure that uh, I've developed that I'm really, really happy with for patients who have partial paralysis with synkinesis. Again, until now, for the majority of these patients, we had you know Botox and neuromuscular retraining. Sometimes we would do a cross-based nerve graft and gracilis, which is still a really great option for a lot of patients. But now we've kind of developed a, a nice treatment for the individual. So uh, again, as you recall, with synkinesis, you have frowning muscles that essentially turn your smile upside down. Uh, rather than it going up, it goes down. So what do we do? We, uh, what we develop is a, a procedure called a selective neurolysis uh, that we combine uh, in individuals, uh, in some individuals with a face and neck lift and maybe a static suspension sling or so. But essentially the concept of the operation is the nerves that are going to these sprouting muscles, we release them, allowing all the activity of the nerves to go to the smiling muscles. And this has been a really, really great um, positive outcome for a lot of patients. So this is a typical patient. As you could see, again, I like to discuss teeth because teeth show really convey uh, a really nice uh, uh, outcome for patients. And as you could see, this is a smile mechanism before the surgery and this is a smile mechanism after. You see the corner of the mouth is going up. A lot more teeth show. Dimpling is gone. The tightness in the neck is improved. This is an individual with bilateral synkinesis. This was her maximum smile. And this is after surgery. Again, you see a lot more teeth. And you also get, again, improvement in the neck area. And these are other examples. And um, other options for patients who have partial paralysis is the cross-based nerve graft and gracilis. And if you recall, this is a patient who had uh, a hypoglossal facial nerve transfer, which got a good result, good symmetry, but her, uh, his smile has a lot of synkinesis. So we went ahead and also did a cross-based nerve graft and gracilis because he wanted to have a little bit more spontaneity. And this is, and that was uh, his, a smile afterwards. So in conclusion, facial palsy is a complex medical condition. Facial reanimation is not perfect, as you could see, and cannot truly reproduce a perfect smile. Uh, but we can, with static and dynamic procedures and Botox and neuromuscular retraining and really great, great attention to detail, we can improve the smile mechanism and improve functional issues. And uh, we now have really, really great, you know, mastered facial nerve transfer, cross-based nerve graft with gracilis, and selective neurolysis as options that have really improved synkinesis and partial paralysis. 
I want to again thank um, the audience for uh, uh, tuning in and uh, uh, the Fisher Paralysis Foundation for the opportunity to give this talk. Dr. Dizade? Yes. Um, I have a, we have time for just a few questions, so I will go ahead if that's is that fine with you now? Perfect. Okay, yes. wonderful. Um, I have one question. Say is, uh, does success of reanimation procedures vary based on how long the patient has had facial paralysis? Okay, so the answer, uh, the question again, I'm going to repeat it. Does the success of facial reanimation procedure vary depending on how long the individual has had that uh, has had the paralysis? So the answer is yes and no. Uh, if someone has had paralysis, let's say again, I'm going to give an example uh, of someone had a temporal bone fracture or trauma, the face was completely paralyzed. It does make a difference if you come in and start up the facial reanimation uh, surgeries within two years rather than 10 years later because you, you can get the masteric facial nerve transfer in addition to the cross-based nerve graft and gracilis. The masteric facial nerve transfer will give tone, will give some improvement in smile, and the cross-based nerve graft will give you that spontaneity. That same individual, if they come in four years, five years later, may only be candidates for cross-based nerve graft and gracilis. And because their muscles have been atrophied and the masteric facial nerve transfer will no longer work. So there is a timing issue. Now, having said that, ultimately, the difference between someone who's had it 20 years ago and 10 years ago or 20 years ago and four years ago probably doesn't make any difference because the options are, are available regardless of how long you've had these, the paralysis. Now, the outcome does vary depending on your age. So someone who's very young, like a five-year-old, six-year-old, will generally have a higher likelihood of success with cross-face nerve graft and gracilis than someone who's 80. So the age of the individual does matter. However, the duration doesn't really matter. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, another question is, if I do choose Botox treatments, how often generally will I need to repeat these? And how long does Botox the treatment normally last? Yeah, great question. So the question is uh, for Botox treatments, let's say for synkinesis, or for creating symmetry on the opposite side, how often do you need to get the treatments? So typically Botox in most individuals lasts anywhere between three to six months. For some, it's a little bit shorter. Not for many people, it's longer. I typically recommend three treatments annually for Botox, so about every four months or so. Now there are some, some of my patients who come in every six months, some patients who come in every three months. But typically I'd like the Botox will wear off a little bit so we can see what the results of the, or how the uh, synkinesis or facial paralysis has evolved. So typically, I recommend three treatments annually. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Um, I do have one considering um, about eye dryness. They say, I have constant dryness on the paralyzed side with my eye. Besides using eye drops constantly, is there any other, anything else I can do to help with this? Uh, so for eye dryness, number one, I recommend every person who has any severe form or even moderate form of facial paralysis, you should see mm -hmm. an uh, ophthalmologist at least once a year, maybe more, depending on how severe the issue is. Because they have to look at the cornea and make sure the cornea is not very dry or excoriated or ulcerated and so forth. So that's very, very important. And you have to allow your ophthalmologist to give you the information in terms of how what you need to do for lubrication. But generally speaking, you need to use your artificial tears all the time. And number two, at nights, if you have a lot of dryness, you can use mm -hmm. that lacquer loop that we talked about to keep the eyes really, really um, uh, lubricated. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Zizadeh. Um, this will end our question and answer period. 
And I thank you, for everyone, for attending today. Um, I will be sending you a follow-up email tomorrow, and it, there's a brief survey attached. If you could please answer the questions, that will help us improve our webinar offerings. And also, if you'd like to be notified of our future webinars, just please indicate that in the survey, or you can respond by email to us. And we will put you on our list. We will have these periodically now. And you can also visit our website, facialparalysisfoundation.org, for more information on support group meetings, webinars, and different information. Um, and if you have, if we weren't able to answer your question today, please just email us at facialparalysisfound at gmail.com, and we will pass that on to the doctor. Um, I appreciate everyone for attending our first webinar, and hope we have many more, and you can be a part. Thanks so much, Dr. Aziz, today and everyone who attended.